Hey everyone, Biofan here with Bioware producer Liz Laytonin. Hi, this is Liz. <laughs> so, what is your favorite color? Uh, I have two, but this is just because I'm a massive sports fan. So, <laughs> uh, green and gold, because I am from Wisconsin, and I am a Green Bay Packers fan. Oh, okay. So as it would be, but otherwise, I don't know. Colors are nice. They're all good. How long have you been at Bioware? 3.5 years. Oh, okay. 3.5 cool. is very important. Um, <laughs> I started in September of 2012. Okay. Yeah. So what does a producer do, and how is that different in the video game industry? I, I have to admit, I've only ever been in the video game industry, so I don't have a better comparison for this. But producers do different things based off what studios you work in. Um, specifically at Bioware, um, we have a production sort of group, and the production group is split into two different types of individuals. One is like the project manager type of individual and one is the producer type. And the primary thing is producers care about the what and the PMs care about the the how or the project managers care about the how. Um, a lot of my job is working with uh, Mike and Matt and Mark. Uh, so yeah, Michael Ablaw, Matt Goldman and Mark Dara when I was on Dragon Age, taking their vision and making sure that my team's vision aligns with it or, you know, we go back and forth and figure out what needs to happen. Um, I think of myself as a mass facilitator and do my best to make sure that my team always knows what's up. What are you currently working on? I am on the new IP. Ooh. And I just made a big old grin at my screen, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as much as you can tell us, you pretty got much. It. <laughs> <laughs> I even double checked. Can I say that I'm on the new IP? They're like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So is Inquisition the only Bioware title you've worked on? Yeah, uh, Inquisition, and then I was on Hack on Descent and Trespasser. Awesome. So, yeah, with the DLC. Okay, which DLC was your favorite? Um, wow. So, um, okay, I'm going to say Trespasser, uh, primarily because I felt like we really kind of just got our flow together on that. We knew exactly the story that we wanted to tell, and we were able to just sort of, you know... Everybody was really aligned, and we were just able to kind of shoot that out the door. Um, not quickly, but, you know, kind of cohesively. Uh, Hack on I loved because I was with um, my team that I was working with on the main game, which was the exploration team. And we kind of took all the things that we would really wanted to do in the main game and said, okay... Let's make sure the story is really seriously, seriously intertwined in this exploration area. And let's add in all the little bits and bobs that we'd wanted to add in the main game and we just ran out of time. Um, so I, I like both. I'm going to say Trespasser better, but it meant Hack On's a close second. I really liked how in Hack On it was laid out to where pretty much you could be at anywhere. And like 360 degrees, there was a way to get to like any point kind of like laid out for you. Like you could see how exactly how to get there. It was great. Yep. That was the map that we shipped is the second or third iteration because it was actually originally the start point was up by that, uh, the big ruins up top. Oh, and then okay, um, cool. after a few of our reviews, we moved it kind of towards the middle. And then in the final review, we decided to move it at the bottom. Felt like it had a better flow for the story, but also driving you kind of both directions. So yeah, it was good. Okay, cool, cool. So I've been to the Austin studio and it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, what is the Edmund studio like? Edmonton Studio is very Edmontonian, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like the Austin Studio at all. Um, so for those of us that aren't from Edmonton, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of a polite way to put this. Um, it's on the backside of a hotel, which is great. It's a big atrium in the middle of the hotel, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, it's just a kind of a slightly older brick building, and the floors are nice. All the rooms that I've been in have been nice big open floor plans, which is really good, because I really prefer that, but not all the rooms are that way. Um, so that's really nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not the most exciting studio in the whole world, but the people make it Well, so. don't tell me that. I'm sorry. Don't ruin the dream, I'd Liz. I'd love to say it is. Well, actually, when I first arrived, it was super exciting because when you walked around the floors, all the Mass Effect people were up on the walls, and there was a wall to ceiling Garrus, who I was madly in love with. <laughs> and then they took him down because they tore down that wall, and they didn't save him <sighs> for me. It's a little upsetting. Oh, that's so sad. I know. So I know the answer to this one, but um, for those that don't know, who is your favorite romance in Inquisition Spoilers. and why? And in the whole series. Um, so obviously, my favorite romance in Inquisition, based off my last two years of embarrassing Twitter feed, um, <laughs> is 
Cullen. Uh, I absolutely adore him and have adored him since the first game. So I was really happy to see his Inquisition kind of come to full, full fruitation, as we would say it. Um, I did love the Solus romance uh, as well, though, just because I'm a, I'm a big... Uh, I, I love the Heartbreakers, which is why... Sorry, Cullenites. My favorite romance of all time is Alistair. Okay, that's acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was a city elf, and oh, no. I felt my only option was to give him up to the throne, and then I really felt like I needed to do the Morgan thing, and I don't think I've ever screamed louder at a video game than the point at which I had to watch him and Morgan together. So It just gets messier from there. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was not good. At the time, I was working on The Sims um, at another studio, and our external producer was in, in from EA. And I remember walking in and just being like, I hate you people. I can't believe you did that to me. I, <laughs> I had to give him up because I even gave him up. I gave him up. Let him go be king. Let him have Morgan. And I walked away. It was awful. So, oh, no. yep, so that's obviously a big feeler for me but yeah so what is your favorite scene with colin um oh, this was kind of a hard one because there was a number of scenes that i liked and a lot of them for different reasons sometimes it was just because i worked more closely with it or sometimes it was just because i liked the scene itself um i would say there was kind of three that i liked all for different reasons um i love the the culmination scene, uh, not necessarily because of the culmination itself. Do you know what I mean by, I'm sure you know what I mean by culmination. For those that don't know what you mean, (laughs) what does it mean? It's when Cullen throws you down on the table. That's the culmination scene. Oh, okay. That one. Okay. Desk involved. All right. That one. But the actual, my actual favorite point of the whole scene is when you're sitting in the office and the Inquisitor is listening to him with his team and he's looking a little bit stressed out and he's doing a lot of orders and she's sitting back just sort of watching him and she kind of has an eyebrow raise. Probably one of my favorite scenes with the Inquisitor in the whole game. So I actually love it because of that specific shot that was done by the cinematic uh, designer on it. So I love that. Um, the chess scene is amusing. I love kind of Dorian sort of banter back and forth with him. So I do love that scene. And I, I kind of love the idea that I can let him win or not let him win as the Inquisitor. And it gave me a nice option there. Um, and the last one is I do love all the scenes where um, Josephine and Liliana are ribbing him at the war table when you get together with them. It's amusing. So. <laughs> So, who are the wonderful people that we have to thank for Colin's wedding scene? You can say Brienne and just repeat her name a hundred times there. It was all Thank Brienne. you, Brienne. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made it, but it was it was it was her baby, so And then is Garrus your favorite Mass Effect romance option? Yeah. I just I never quite clicked in Mass Effect one. I think I was with Caden and I was like, yeah. <sighs> You're kind oh, of a. I'm sorry. Oh, judging you so much. <laughs> it just wasn't my favorite. Uh, I mean, it was fine. Like, it was okay. That was enjoyable. But I don't know. When Garrus wanted to calibrate me, it was just perfect. And I, mean, <laughs> I, just, I just. He was He was already my bro, right? And he was perfect. Mm-hmm. And I loved him. And he was already my favorite squad mate. And then when. And I think also in, in Mass Effect 2, I just. I, I didn't like the romance options when I first came in. I was like, I can have a snake, a lizard, or this guy who just. <laughs> always whiny like does he ever not whine and then um yeah and then he and then garris was just exactly what i wanted my best friend right and then it it went further it was really awesome so i always love to ask developers this what are some of the best funny stories you have from inquisitions development well um see I, i always find the funny ones are Ones you can't totally share, but I can share bits of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, you can dance around things you're not supposed to tell people. <laughs> yeah, I can dance around. Um, okay. There's always a point in every project where you have to walk around to every single desk and say, okay, everybody, what did you put into the game that shouldn't be in there? <laughs> <laughs> and then you get this really sheepish like artist who remembers that two years ago he put something in a scene that we definitely was not covered under our ESRB. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you find something in a cave and you're like, I, I don't think that we can do that in a cave. Um, you know, and then you kind of have to double check. You have to like walk in and talk to Mike Laidlaw and be like, uh, Mike, um, somebody wanted to do something in a cave and it goes like this. And Mike's like, oh, no, we can't do that in caves. I'm like, okay, okay, we can't do that in caves. <laughs> My so, mind is going to some really interesting places with that. <laughs> yeah, th- there, was, there, was some, there were some fun ones. Uh, Trespasser, we had one that we actually had to remove um, because it wasn't covered under our initial ESRB. 
Um, and the funny thing about DLC is that uh, you're basically your ESRB technically covers your your DLC to um, as long as you don't add in anything that isn't covered under the initial one. And I, I you've probably read our our ESRB, which is what mm-hmm. was amazing, and it was so funny just to read it. I um, remember reading and be like, "Who says that line?" I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my favorite Reddit thread ever. With everybody on our Dragon Age was just like, "Who would say that?" Oh my gosh! And you guys started putting bets down on it. That was hilarious. <laughs> I bet it Iron Bull and I won. So yeah, well there you go. See, that was that was in in retrospect obvious, but at the time. Uh, but anyway, but yeah, so that's always really entertaining. Um, I did. There was a moment during E3. That that I don't know if very many people know about. Um, I went down with Mark Dara and Mike Laidlaw and, and, and a bunch of the, the support team down there to go show off the demo. And um, we were at the very last demo of all of E3. And we're, um, I'm, I'm sitting in the back. I'm sitting next to Blair, who's um, Blair Brown, the other producer who's, who's playing the final demo. And Mark Dara is up front. And for every single demo, he has to go through and speak. Did you see it at E3 this year? Uh, I was not at that E3, but I remember um, later they released the demos for YouTube. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but I I think they released one where like Mike Laidlaw is talking over the top of it. So at E3, um, either Mike or Mark was always at the front of the room and they were talking through basically exactly what was talked through in the video. And because it'd been, I don't know, what is it, three or five days or however long it is, um, of them having to do this every half an hour. And sometimes they do like five in a row and then switch. And it was really exhausting. In between it, they were doing interviews and stuff like that. And we were about, you know, maybe three quarters of the way through the very final one. And there's a, there's a sort of um, a quiet spot for a bit for the person who's doing the talking because there was a lot of combat and stuff. Yeah, and the courtyard kind of bit where the combat takes place, I think. Exactly, Somewhere exactly. So yeah. we finished that. And we kind of go through the room. I think it was about that part. You're probably right. And um, Mark was supposed to start talking again. And we look up to the front of the room, and we're all in the back, and Mark is basically dozed off at the podium up front. <laughs> and the, the, the yes guy that was with us like had to be like, clap his hands and be like, Mark, wake up! And Mark was like, oh, oh and he gosh. just starts again with the thing. And he was right on ball. He didn't even have to relook where he was. He was just like, oh, okay, and then just starts going. That was, <laughs> it still cracks me up when I think about it, so, yeah. What was your favorite bug or glitch that was encountered? Um... Wow, bug or glitch, bug or glitch. We had a lot of really weird ones. I think we've talked about a lot of them, though. Like, like Mr. Noodle the Pony was still my favorite, because he was Mr. Never... What the what? Did we call him Noodle? Poodle? Sir Noodle. Sir Noodle, Sir Noodle yeah. So Sir Noodle, um, he, the, the horse, he was mm-hmm. always screwed up. Like, sometimes his legs were swimming. Sometimes he was like, Dorian was flying on him. Literally, you you never knew if you sat on the horse what the hell was going to happen at the end of the day. <laughs> so the horse was always my favorite. Um, we did have one during Trespasser that was quite funny, where, um, you know, that the the uh, the level with all the, the islands in it, the big labyrinth with the islands? Yeah. So there was a point where every time you would go to another island, all the bad guys would sort of teleport to you, um, but only if you kind of look at them. So as soon as you sort of face their direction, all of a sudden you'd have a full teleport of like six bad guys. And it always cracked me up because like everybody, in, when we were doing the reviews, would be like, get over here from like Mortal Kombat. <laughs> so <we'd> <laughs> pull them over. So yeah, that was fun. What are some of the most constructive ways that the team has received feedback from the players? Um, I find that... When I've, I've seen a few posts on our forums and, and, and a few on our Dragon Age especially, I think does this really well, um, where the initiator will write out a, just sort of a really thoughtful post about like, these are the things that I liked and these are the things that I didn't like. And they'd give a nice explanation for it. And it would be really even mannered. Like it doesn't call out anything. It just sort of says, I didn't like these things for these reasons. And I did like them for these reasons. Because for us, the reasons are most important. Like it's, you can say that you don't like something, but if you if you just say, oh, I, I, I hate Dorian or whatever, it's like, well, why do you hate Dorian? Do you, do, you, do you not like his mustache? You know, do you not like his hair? Do you think that he looks silly? Do you not like his accent? You know, there's just so much there. And when you get the, when you get the initial um, thought, which is really good, but followed up with, with an explanation, those are always really good. And yeah, in our Dragon Age, there's a lot of really good ones like this. So... Um, what are some of the aspects of Inquisition's feedback that could likely be applied to future Bioware titles in general? Um, I would probably, 
I don't I don't actually know a good answer for this one. I'll have to be honest, mm-hmm. um, because the you know our our titles are all just a bit different from each other. I would say the primary thing here would be that you know we know how important the meaningful meaningful choices is to you guys, and we are kind of paying attention to what's being said. So I can imagine there'll be a lot of eyesights on that specific pillar. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, what are the stages of game development and what are they like at Bioware? Uh, so, um, we're relatively typical in terms of other studios that I've worked with in the sort of sense that you often have, um, uh, your development goes through phases and at the end of each phase, there's a sort of review. Um, more specifically, I can talk to the levels process because that's what I worked with. And, and one of our biggest challenges on Dragon Age was trying to figure out how to review our levels because uh, it was the first time that we'd ever had a level that could take, you know, three hours, five hours, six hours to play through. And most people who are doing a review, like you'll sit in a room together for one hour or two hour and play through. Um, And we realized really quickly that this wasn't viable for Dragon Age, especially um, for, you know, for these massive levels, like Emerald Graves, like at at your best, you're going to take, you know, three hours to go through it if you're trying to be quick and, and maybe six if you're trying to be a completionist kind of mattering or Crestwood, you know, to lower the dam and then get the dragon on the other side. And there's just so many steps to it. Um, so, you know, we go through the typical sort of um, the thing where we, we kind of lay out the pacing and the spacing of the level and we kind of put in where we want the nar- major narrative points to be. Uh, and then we start building that up. And, and each sort of build-up stage is, is another stage of our review. So we'll all go in and, and find a way to review it. Um, specifically for our exploration levels, we had to use a, a sort of survey process where we would send out the build to the whole team. So, you know, 200 and by the end, I don't know, 200 and something odd people would be playing through the levels and giving us extensive like eight pages of survey feedback um, based off across the whole level. And we have a really awesome uh, sort of analytics um, uh, service that we use internally that where we can actually see where people are playing and where they get killed and where they interact with things and where they loot things. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's really amazing. And and the great thing is, is we can actually layer all the sessions on top of each other. So we can go like, oh, Ooh. like 50 people died at that spot. Like, what the heck is going on there? Or, <laughs> yeah, or like, uh, you know, the, like, why did everybody run that direction here when we really wanted them to run the other direction and kind of be able to look at it. And y- you'll see this a lot in video games because that's the point at which you start seeing um, like a light one direction versus the other direction being dark. And that's your friendly gameplay designer saying, hey, please come over this way because we'd really like you to see something this direction. And yeah, so the the, the survey and the review process combined with the, the data that we use is, it's really powerful. It allows the whole team to play the game a lot and gets everybody really integrated into it. So yeah, we do a lot of that here, a lot of playing and integration if we can. Um. I don't know if you can explain, um, but at the very beginning of a game's development, how does it sort of start? So I haven't been at the beginning of a game's development at Bioware, um, but in previous studios that I worked at, you usually get together, and I I think it's pretty similar here, um, you usually get together sort of a group of the the core people that you know will be working on the the next iteration of whatever it is or whatever game's going to be started, and they'll start coming up with boundaries on the idea to sort of say, okay, so we know that, um, you know, we want the next game to, you know, be in, I don't know, you know, not in Ferelden, right? And we know we want it to be over here. So, and we know that we want to have Canary in it. And they'll start like just setting these boundaries around it and kind of say, this is what we want. This is what we don't want. Um, like for instance, for the DLC, I can give this as a good example. Uh, so okay, yeah. for, for Hackon as an example, so we knew that we wanted to explore the Avar, right? And we knew mm-hmm. that was a, a direction that we wanted to go. So we had that as a, we had that as a sort of uh, kind of boundary to say, okay, we know this is going to be at least partially about the Avar. And then we, you know, you kind of say, okay, well, what story do we want to tell? And as you work through what stories you want to tell, um, the concept artist comes in and they'll start drawing things out and then they'll go back and forth with the writer and the producer and, and look again at the vision and direction that's been given from the top. And that all kind of mashes together into an initial idea. And that idea is usually then pitched somewhere. Um, and my previous studios, we would have then pitched it to a publisher. Um, here, uh, we would pitch it to the senior leadership team and and get their approval. And then often that goes even higher up. Like sometimes Aaron uh, Flynn will take a look at it and make sure that he's happy with it. 
as he's about to spend the money on it. Um, yeah, and then and, and then we kind of progress from there. So usually an idea, but not from an individual, from a group of individuals who are highly invested in it. Okay, okay, cool. Um, and then I reached out to social media and through YouTube and pulled questions from fans for you as well. Okay. What is the biggest obstacle you and your team have overcome during the production of Inquisition? Um... It was definitely the breadth of the game. It was so big. And there's so many facets of it um, that it was almost it was almost impossible to get the whole game into your head. And that was that was insane. Uh, towards the end of the project, I've talked to this about this previously, but I was running some morning playthroughs with all the senior leadership. And I think it took us um, you know, two weeks just to run through the game from front to end. And, you know, and then and then additional weeks to do the followers and things like that. So um, yeah, so it was just, it, it was just kind of this, uh, crazy, crazy thing where there was so much going on. And when stuff came in, the nice part about it is that you're, you're, you're delighted because you see something and you had no idea that it was going to be there. Like I remember the first time I ran out to the exalted plains and the, um, the solace plot was in there with his demon friend. So I'm sitting at my desk doing a review of the Exalted Plains, and I'm starting to bawl behind my desk because I just had to, like, kill his really good friend who we talked about. It was the first time I'd ever seen it. I didn't even know it was going to be in the game. Um, so it's both, it's both a benefit and a, and a sort of end of frustration. Just mm -hmm. it's, it's really difficult to keep this big of a game in your head or anybody's head, and you just can't. So breadth. I don't even know how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty impressed with you guys. Like when you go through and you do your big long, like, oh, this happens because of X, or I saw this and that happened. I was like, I have no idea how you guys do that. Like I've read all the lore books and done all the things, and I still can't. <laughs> Very impressive. Uh, what part of Inquisition are you most proud of? Um, so my team was the like the X of the world building team, the exploration team. So it was the team that built the built the big levels and. Um, I really loved uh, Empire du Leon. Uh, it's one of my favorite levels, and I was really happy and proud of that level. But sort of more specifically, um, on Trespasser, uh, because DLC is kind of a little bit more freeform, uh, I was kind of allowed to noodle and, and make my own levels for Trespasser. I used to be a designer, so for me it was... It was really good to actually get my fingers back in the tools because you don't do that too much as a producer. Uh, oh, so cool. Which areas did you build? Those four little rooms where you could get the armor set. Oh, those. Those were cool. Yeah, I, I built those. So I was just really like, it was just so cool to actually be in the engine and create actual content that actually shipped. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. If you could pick anywhere in Thetis to live, where would it be and why? N no, just no. <laughs> like, Thetis is like... You'd it's get not, killed. It's not a friendly place. Yeah. There's like yeah. demons and undead and nasty people and politics and gods wanting to kill you. No. <laughs> I, I read this. I'm like, no, I just, I, I want to live in Thetis. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you, if you had to, like, if you, if like uh, by some like way you, your sentence for some reason was to be sent to Thetis, but you got to pick where, where would it be? Um, this is just cruel. What? <laughs> um okay uh i really like the emerald graves so the dales okay, okay. yeah with all the trees and with stuff. all the trees i really like that okay. okay you know besides all the things wanting to kill me in it excluding romance ability who is your favorite character from inquisition and why um i have two mm -hmm. uh one is the quizquisition guy because he cracked me up <laughs> like, every time i encountered him and I loved that he was in my bedroom and stuff. It was really creepy, but it was awesome. Uh, but actually, Dorian. I love Dorian. He was my new bro. He's my new Garrus. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, why wasn't Colin's lion helmet from the trailers in the game? You know, probably because the Colonites were so gaga for Cocoa Puffs over its face. <laughs> and I might have been too in some of the reviews. So I think we could have just removed it. <laughs> you just wanted to see more of his face. <laughs> How did Cullen change over the course of Inquisition's development? Uh, well, originally, I think he was like 45, 50. What? Well, it was, it was kind of accidental. There was a, um, there was, there was slightly, 
There's a slight disconnect, which happens sometimes. Like I said, it's a big game um, between uh, the writing and the concept team at one point. And so the concept team had translated what they'd wrote as him being older. And I remember looking at his picture going, huh, I didn't think that he would have gray hairs. It hasn't been that long. I mean, I've got gray hairs, but I'm like six years older than him. So <laughs> kind of going through this thought process and yeah, I showed him, showed him to them, you know, to the writers and they're like, wait a second, no, Colin isn't that old. Like he's, he's, he's younger than this. Um, I do two weeks before we shipped, his hair was platinum blonde and I, we, there was begging, a lot of begging <laughs> to get that fixed so that his hair was back to the normal color. Just something happened, just a freak accident. Somebody fixed a shader and it made his hair Platinum blonde. So that was not great. He would have been a valley boy. Uh oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any features or scenes that made it into Dragon Age Inquisition that almost didn't? Um, well, we did actually cut one exploration area that was due to ship. So that, oh, really? Yeah, and, and we just trashed it. We never used it. Um, and uh, Storm Coast almost didn't make it. We had, you're right, we had two designers literally pull all nighters. Uh, to get the Storm Coast in because they loved what um, our artist, level artist, Andrew Farrell, had done with the area. Uh, so the Storm Coast almost didn't make it. Um, we had a few followers that almost didn't make it. Oh, wow. How did each DLC get its name? And for Trespasser, was Wolf Hunt ever considered? It was on the table uh, at one point. <laughs> um, I adored it, but it's really close to Witch Hunt. And I don't think that there's any way we could have gone and passed naming because you always have to kind of make sure the name isn't being used anywhere else. And so, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't anywhere there. And then in terms of how we actually got the name, um, I know that kind of the initial thoughts went through kind of the lead designer on it. Um, Patrick, of course, is the lead writer and the producers and a few other people were kind of in a smaller chain. Like my Leilana, we were all discussing the potentials for the name since we weren't going to use Wolf Hunt. And, um, and I do remember people putting out a bunch of different names because what we were trying to look for is obviously something that has quite a lot of meetings, meanings in it is what, you know, what we were primarily looking for. And, and something that, like a name where ideally you look backwards on it and you go, oh, <laughs> you know, like that was really good, right? Um, so, yeah, I think we went around in circles for a couple of weeks. And then uh, finally, I think Mike threw down on Trespasser. So. Okay, cool. How did the other two DLCs get their name? At Hackon, I think Patrick just came up right out of the box. Uh, we actually, on the Hackon, actually, we had an original name, and I don't remember what the name of it is, but that one got ixnade um, by the naming people. We couldn't use it. It was used by something. Um, so we did actually, that was actually our second name choice, but I think the better of the two, retrospectively. Okay. And yeah. then Descent? Uh, descent, well, you go down a lot. <laughs> <laughs> <In a big one. laughs> I'm pretty actually sure the Austin folks recommended that okay, one. Okay, okay. Um, and they were working on it, and they really liked the name, and they, they brought it forth, and uh, Mike agreed. What is something you've always wanted to tell people about Inquisition and or Bioware, but have never been asked? Um, trying to... This one is actually a little bit of a hard one for me, because... We talk a lot <laughs> with you guys. Um, I, and I, I don't actually, I haven't followed everything that we've said. Um, I did want to say that, you know, Trespar, Trespasser was a bit of a, of a homage to our, to our fans. And I think also to ourselves. Like, we, we knew the story that we wanted to tell. But for all the developers on it, it was, for many of us, it was our last chance to be on Dragon Age. And it was our last chance to say thank you to everybody. Um, so we, you know, we did try to kind of add in those little bits and bobs here and there that were our sort of polite present your direction, a little bit of fun, a little bit of play. Um, so I will say that uh, we, I think we all loved working on Trespasser. It was really awesome. Um, and I, I don't know, I think just at Bioware as a whole, I mean, you probably heard this previously, but uh, this is the first place I've worked as a female developer where I've felt it hasn't really mattered. And I, and I, and I, and I kind of love that. Like, That's I've, awesome. Yeah, my opinion is taken just flat out as my opinion, and I don't deal with a lot of the, like, oh, but clearly you're from marketing. Sorry, marketing people. <laughs> um, <laughs> or something, you know, because that's, that's what you get a lot of, like, uh, when you go to conferences as, as a female, like, oh, so you're in marketing or you're in finance. And I'm like, no, previously was a designer, but, you know, I'm a producer. And they're like, oh, okay, that's kind of crazy. But it, I worry it's never been that way. It's been open and welcome, and there's a lot of ladies here, I think, because of that. And we have some wonderful men who work around us who do that. 
Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me today, Liz. Yeah, of course. It was a pleasure to have a, to have a, a chat with you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Liz Leitonen. Be sure to also check out my interviews with Bioware lead writer Patrick Weeks, Heroes of Dragon Age Mobile community manager Deanna Jones, as well as several others. For more Dragon Age, Mass Effect, and Bioware-related videos, subscribe to my channel by clicking the big red subscribe bar up here on the screen. For instant news coverage of Bioware games, you can also follow me on Twitter and other forms of social media, links to which can be found down in the video description. If you like my video and would like to donate to help support my channel, head on over to my Patreon page. For more information about how your donations can help me improve my channel, here's a link to a video about that provided on screen as well.